Great. Good stuff. Okay, so welcome everybody to um, Unrehearsed Futures, our discussion of theater's unrehearsed future. This is our ninth session of our second season. And um, I am very, very excited to invite uh, you and my two dear friends, Paola Coletto and Cass Fleming, to discuss our topic this evening, which is entitled Masterless Women Teaching Physical Theater. And we have Cass to thank for this, thank for this marvelous title. I was going to suggest Femi Mimes. I'm very glad we didn't go with Femi Mimes. Uh, so it, instead we have a reflection on three terms um, which are uh, very uh, important to uh, us in, in, in certain obvious ways. Um, woman, physical theater, and master. But I, before I begin, I just want to sort of contextualize a little bit um, that we are not suggesting that the term woman is a kind of stable subject. We, we understand that this word is socially constructed um, uh, and it provides a kind of uh, experiential frame. Um, I'm gonna suggest that maybe we consider woman as even a verb. We could talk about being womaned or womaning. Um, but uh, the intention is really to open up an inclusive space for dialogue. So this is not a space where only people who identify as women are supposed to speak. That is not the case. Um, it's a discussion. We're gonna be inviting you to participate in our discussion. So I'm gonna put some framing questions in the chat for you to consider. And, uh, but we're gonna begin with um, my two wonderful guests talking about their connection to this topic. That'll take about half an hour. And then we will open the room up to a general discussion and we really invite you to participate. Um, you can put uh, questions, thoughts, comments into the chat, um, but when the time comes, you can also simply raise your hand uh, either physically or with that little emoji. And uh, Falguni Rao, who is our wonderful um, assist, uh, assist here, she'll be creating the, the um, reportage for this event. She will be scanning the room to help me identify you. If you wanna just simply raise your hand and, and unmute yourself and speak. That's when we get to the discussion bit. Um, okay, so first let me introduce my two uh, dear friends and colleagues, Paola Coletto, who is the director at the School for Theater Creators in Padova, Italy. And Paola and I trained together in the pedagogic year at the Lecoq School in Paris with Jacques Lecoq and have been fast friends ever since. And Cass Fleming, who is lecturer in the Department of, of Theater and Performance at Goldsmiths University of London in the UK. And Cass was my first supervisor and she was very inspiring. And she, uh, she launched me on my ongoing doctoral journey. Uh, and that was a great, great help to me and assist. Um, so I think we have decided that Paola, I'm gonna ask you first um, to introduce yourself around uh, some, some key, so, so to just frame your, uh, your introduction to yourself around some questions, which are, what have been the most important inspirations for your work? Uh, what's the most important thing for you about your work right now? And what is your approach to this topic, the intersection of the words woman, physical theater, and master? Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. And uh, I, I, I just do a little introduction of what my journey was, and I guess this will get in or we'll talk about it at the end. But um, so I'm Italian, originally from Padua, Italy, born and raised there. Um, and uh, I, I start my journey in life <laughs> um, or my career is better uh, in sport. I was a professional athlete in my um, in my young years, the one that are gone. Um, and I had my own gym and I was coaching athlete for uh, competition. And at that time, I have an entrepreneurial flame. So I um, founded either other uh, business organization that are actually still open today. Um, so, I moved later on in, in I mean, on my, I was 26 when I left sport and went to um, theater by, by chance, really. I, 
I met someone uh, watching a movie and he was a clown in Padova. And uh, for some reason I felt compelled to talk to him and I, and I did. And uh, I told him my stories and he said, you know, there's this great school. He, taught, he told me it was a clown school in Paris. And uh, I moved to Paris. I mean, this is exactly how I went. I met him in June and in September I was in Paris. Um, so that's, that's where everything started for me. And um, there I did with Amy, I did the, the, the third pedagogical year because in somehow when I did the school, I realized it wasn't uh, performing that I was looking for. I actually really don't like performing and all the work around performing. I like directing uh, and I love teaching. Um, so this is where it, it all started to develop. Uh, <clears throat> and I have the fortune that I travel back and forth everywhere and I work with so many culture and so uh, many different um, different people. And I think that for me is one of my uh, focus point. I, in my work at least, um, I love, uh, I have a school now in, in, in that I run that is closed because of COVID. Uh, but the most important things for me is the um, different cultures um, that uh, represented by the students, uh, because I think that the um, the importance of the work that uh, I want to do is the possibility of creating. Um, not just theater and not just cult culture, but poetry, something that struck the human being. And that's above culture. We have to find a language that speaks to the soul. And so um, different difference of languages and difference of cultures, when you get them together and they have to work together to create something that unite them, I find that the, 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 the most effective um, way to to get to what I'm I am um, I'm talking about I'm thinking. Um, so back to my journey, I, I I I started my first school in Italy in uh, 1999 with uh, Giovanni Fossetti. Maybe someone knows about him. It's a, it's a, I co-founded the school with him, and I ran it for with them for five years. Uh, and then I relocated to uh, Chicago, United States, uh, because my ex-husband was American, and somehow I wanted to, I wanted to travel. I wanted to see different things, diff how way things was made different. So I didn't feel like it was the time for me to um, settle. In it with the school and, and uh, grow that. And the other problem, which I think is relevant to today, is that when we opened the school, our first school, we really opened it on the, um, on the line of Jacques Lecoq. It was like the Jacques Lecoq school baby. <laughs> I mean, we did everything the same. Uh, which was great because, you know, we didn't know really how to start a school. And so that gave us a, a, a fantastic frame. Uh, our first year, imagine that our first year was uh, made of people that has been refused uh, to go in the second year on Lecoq. So we started with a second year. So this is how much Lecoq it was. And I think personally, I grew out of it during the five years that I was running the school, that I was teaching and running the school. And it started to become a problem for me to replicate. I wanted to expand that. I wanted to, you know, I have other training uh, um, in holistic, in coaching, and I wanted to, um, the material to be more flexible than just 
follow the um, footstep of the Lecoq school. So that's one of the reason why I left too. Um, and, and so I, I end up in Chicago and I stayed there for 15 years, which I love Chicago. I love America. I love Americans. <laughs> I went line dancing last night. <laughs> okay, close parenthesis. And, and it was and, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, very humbling because <clears throat> I was going there with, you know, the, the, the six year of school that we had. And we have been very successful. We win awards. We were on the newspaper in town. We were like, everybody knew us. So I went to the United States thinking that that was known by the universe, of course, and uh, it wasn't that way. So I had to start from scratch everything and build up again. My first workshop, nobody even called for information, no one person. So it was, it was, you know, it was like smashing in the wall, but, um, Eventually, I went through that, and my that was my biggest fortune, I think, because uh, because of that, I have to accept a work at the university, which I, I'm now an academic, and I thought I will never get mixed with academics. Personally, I'm too good for academia, so <laughs> this is where we're coming from. Is it great? Um, so I accepted a job at the, uh, the university and it was the most amazing experience. I stayed there for eight years working in three different universities because that gave me exactly what I was looking for. Uh, the possibility of using all the tools that I have, all the materials I have, all the set journeys that I have to uh, at the service of the, of the students that didn't have my journey, couldn't do my journey. And so I have to put what I have at the service of their journey. And so I've learned to take apart the material and put it back together. And then again, take another piece and put it in another way and to use all my other training too. That was very important. And, and that's when I realized that uh, you know, the Lecoq School, which is my uh, most important experience. So I have to acknowledge that. And I have to acknowledge that uh, going there and my experience with Lecoq uh, was absolutely a life changing. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not the only place where um, I, 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 I created what, what my work is today, who I am today. Uh, sometimes I created who I am today in reaction to Lecoq uh, because I was like, oh, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. This is very clear. I don't want to do that. So I wasn't, I, I can say I never was in conflict or in contrast with them. Um, Although we have our fight, I don't know if you remember Amy, one huge one on the third year on the stairs. Oh my God. Anyway, um, but I was more um, in there, ready, hungry to take what I needed and to realize what I didn't want that was his own uh, practice in a way. Um, so I eventually created my own school there too, uh, which is the School for Theatre Creators, that now is coming back to Italy because I came back to Italy because I have to be with my parents that are older. So now the School for Theatre Creators is becoming part of Arts Academy. And I hope we're starting next October if COVID will allow us because we lost two seasons in all this. And I personally refuse to, to go online. I don't think I couldn't do my work online. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll start again. Um, but in, I was getting to the, to the master 
word and then I'm finished, which is really, um, really important to me. And I love the idea of uh, masterless. Imagine that I wanted to call my school the unschool. So <laughs> masterless is perfect. Uh, they didn't allow me though. They, they were like, no, we no, we don't want to do that. Um, but because often have been um, pointed out as a master or even worse as a guru. And uh, I'm horrified by that. And is it really, the reality is I don't want that responsibility because uh, I always felt that someone that gave you uh, that title makes you responsible for their journey because you are so powerful and so potent and you, know, you can do anything that you should, you could, you must make something happen for them. And then if it doesn't, it doesn't happen, it's your fault. And so that's, that's the first reason that I subtract myself to that. And the second one, uh, equally important, is that I hate to create dependency. Uh, in, in the school, the school is made to give tools to people to be independent on what they want to do. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes I don't like it. It's fine but they have the tools to do it and, and, and they, know, they know how to build. That's for me is the most important thing. Is often I use this uh, uh, analogy like a, an architect, right? That he needs to know how to build. In, uh, like a house needs to stand, a bridge needs to be a bridge. So there are rules for that. Then on the aesthetic of that, it's your art, it's your you know, your creativity. I don't want to have anything to say on that. I, I refuse to create mini Paula. I mean, I'm, I'm already mini, so can you imagine the mini mini? Um, so, but it, it's the, the, the creative independence, the creative thinking, the, the, the freedom. That's what I work for in the school. So this, this doesn't go well with, for me with masters or guru or stuff like that, that often in my experience, they wanted to create a method and system to follow. So you have followers. Um, I, I don't wanna have followers. I wanna have people mm -hmm. that I can exchange and eventually collaborate when they get out of school they become equal, you know, and maybe they become better than me, good for them. Um, and I'm getting older, someone must pick up, right? <laughs> um, so I think for me, uh, like the, the vision behind the school is uh, this. Um, now being a woman, I was talking to Amy about that. Um, I don't know if it's the culture or I don't know if it is uh, that I'm you know, helpless. Sometimes I don't see things, but for me, my experience, I mean, I never, I never felt I was, I, and I'm talking about me. That doesn't mean I didn't see the two different things, but I never thought about, oh, I'm treated differently because I'm a woman or I never put that in my experience. I didn't care. Um, and I think a lot of that I have to say is from the family I come from where um, everything was possible for everybody. And I was the man of the house. I have a brother, <laughs> but uh, my, my dad has a construction. I did have a construction company and I love building. So I was always with him. Uh, building and learning. I can do anything in the house. <laughs> so, so maybe that gave me a little bit of, um, of, of an, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little bit manly. <laughs> Is that, can you say that? 
in a way. So I didn't even pose the question until lately in the United States, this became um, a, a, a focus point. And I did start to realize looking at outside how this can be, it, I mean, not can be, it was, you know, treated in a, in a very different way. Um, so I can, I can go behind that and fight for any uh, differences uh, of any kind. Uh, should I stop? That, that's great, Paula. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, just to say, also, Paula and I have this in common. We talked a lot of uh, autobiography in our pre-chat, our, our rehearsal of an unrehearsed future. Um, uh, and uh, Paula and I have this in common, that we are looking after our aged parents. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Paula and Cass have in common that they're mothers of, of daughters. So this is, you know, it, we were interested in the fact that as, as uh, you know, identified women, we, 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 we talked a lot about autobiography it seemed to come up a lot um Cass can can we can we come to you now thank you Paula that was marvelous yeah, yeah that was great thank you Paula yeah for sure and I think the autobiography is actually really quite interesting we had this meeting and then we realized we talked so much about autobiography and I was like wow we never really do this in this professional sphere as you know, professional pedagogues and theatre directors. It's almost as if it's sort of squashed in the cupboard. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I felt quite liberated that we talked about, you know, pregnancy, childbirth, kids, the menopause, um, caring for elderly, you know, family members. It was quite interesting that that formed part, part of our discussion. And I think some of the things I've been inspired by for the last few years relate those bits of identity politics as well uh, to, to myself and also to the inspirations that I have. Um, I have a similar but different journey to Paola. Uh, I started performing and dancing when I was tiny, when I was about two, um, and sort of continued always in a space, I suppose, of expressive movement. Um, I trained uh, in the 1980s in what I, th what I thought was a Lecoq-based lineage, and I was taught by brilliant um, students of Lecoq and students of uh, De Croo. But I was taught in quite an incredible college in London called Weekends Arts College. It's in Northwest London, and I love it dearly. Uh, and it was quite a radical place, and it was, um, it was very, very ethnically diverse and it trained young people in performing arts from different kinds of backgrounds. It was quite a unique place, but I didn't really quite understand that at the time, I think. Um, it was later on that I realized firstly that the Lecoq world was actually really predominantly white. So I was in a state of shock because I had fallen in love with that, what I thought was his tradition because of the idea, as Paola said, about empowerment and being actor-centered and actors being able to be creators and actors being able to be authors of their own stories, if you like. And I had done this in a really diverse context. So I saw this as something kind of empowering and diversifying and brilliant. So I was a little bit shocked, I think, with that transfer out, number one. And then number two, I started to think, right, well, I'm kind of interested in this lineage. Um, what's this all about? I've moved from being a performer. I was beginning to move into directing. Uh, I was kind of interested in teaching. So I did lots of research and I traced um, Lacroix uh, back to Jacques Capot and I got quite interested in the history of it. And as I was foraging around in this kind of exploration of understanding the stuff that had influenced me, I came across the name of Suzanne Bing in about 1998 and I thought who is this woman and why does she seem to be linked to all the stuff I really love in this technique so to be honest I got slightly obsessive and ever since 1998 I, I've been on a journey uh, I don't know a parallel journey or a love affair I think with Suzanne Bing so I discovered the work of Suzanne Bing um, in that way and became more and more interested in the work that she did and then I became interested in why on earth I had no idea that probably 80% of Lecoq's practice was developed by Suzanne Bing. So as I sort of dug into it, I got interested both in her, you know, her work and her practices, and it's a huge inspiration to me in what I do as a practitioner, as a director, and as a teacher. Um, but also I got, you know, interested in why it was all hidden. 
So lots of digging into this kind of revealed a whole story of these male master teachers in France. So I was like, okay, we've got you know Jacques Capot, got it, right. And then he hands over and there's this amazing man called Michel Saint-Denis. Right, got it, checked, you know what I mean? And then along we go, we've got Jacques Lecoq, great, got, done it, tick. So I had this thing and when I started to look into Bing, and thought, yeah, but she did this and she's not mentioned, but she was doing that and this is amazing. And as I dug in, then I discovered all the other women that Bing had worked with. And then this was just revelation to me. So I thought, ah, oh, so it's not really sort of master lineages. This is all a kind of network of interesting, gorgeous people working together. So through Suzanne Bing, I looked much more at the work of Margaret Naumberg, who Bing went to work with in New York, who was an incredible woman who ran a school in New York, and then subsequently went on to become the founder of art psychotherapy in America. And then I looked at Capo's daughter, Marie-Hélène Dasté, and I realized just how important she was to everything. Lecoq did not invent autocurs. Marie-Hélène invented autocurs by saying to Suzanne Bing, look, this is great what we're doing in the studio, I love it, but can we go off now, please, and do a bit of our own work on this? And we love, we love this thing, we love this improvisation. Can, can we go off now and, and make a piece of theater with it and bring it back? Um, so there was Marie-Hélène, and then who started to making the masks? It was Marie-Hélène, aged 15 in America, making these masks. Um, and then I discovered the, the writings about Jesmyn Howarth, who was a Del Prose teacher who'd worked with Capone, who was terrible and awful, and it was a disaster. And he wrote shockingly sexist things about her. It's a woman, she's clearly a neurotic. Women who teach Del Prose, there's something wrong with them. In the bin, it's a disaster. But when I had a look at that and I really dug into that, I started to understand how much Bing had borrowed from Jesmyn Howarth. And also how Jesmyn Howarth's mistake had helped Bing and then Capo work out how they could take aspects of these things and really make it work. So I ended up with this whole, at first I think I would see it as a genealogy, Foucault talks about genealogies rather than these great big straight lines, masters owning things and all these men. And then a bit later, I, I came across the Deleuze and Guattari's term of rhizome, which maybe I like even more in some ways, like a root, you know, like of a plant, uh, you mm. know, of. Um, everything being connected together. So that really, you know, that really started to inspire me. And since that time, really, um, you know, I've been thinking, okay, there's these connections um, and there's these ways of sharing things. And maybe it's not owned just by a kind of lineage of men. Good job, because I identify as a queer woman. So, you know, I'm quite glad it's not owned by just a group of men. Um, but also I started to think, well, the way that we share and the way that we engage with this and the way that we share and transmit ideas is much richer and much more exciting. And I think essentially it goes against lots of ideas about patriarchy, but I think again, it goes against a lot of ideas of colonialism, a lot of ideas of kind of white supremacy, that people own things, that they control things, that things can only be seen as being valued in one way, you know, who wrote the book, who had the biggest school, who trademarked <laughs> the, the technique, you know, you know, usually Strasbourg, the method, you know. And so I started to think lots more about that as well. So as well as being inspired, I think, very much by the techniques that Bing uh, developed and then, you know, Lecoq developed and, you know, uh, Monica developed or Nushkin developed, this whole strand, I also became a bit inspired about different ways of looking at and understanding our lineages of performance and what, what that might even mean. And the fact that they're not, you know, that these things are never really pure. I think I was seeking something when I did this first research to see what it was that had inspired me. And I wanted to find out this true one route. And, and that's not what I found. I found something much more complex and mixed together. And I guess as that journey has gone on, I realized more and more I'm interested in also bringing myself into the room. You know, I do this work because I like to transform into a tree or, you know, into a muddy pond or into, you know, a leopard. Uh, but at the same time, I also want a space to bring myself into these these rooms um, and into these rehearsal spaces, um, these teaching, these teaching spaces. And I guess I have to also think that, you know, I'm not pure as a person in a way. I'm quite hybrid. Um, I'm looking for the kind of diversity I suppose I had. Um, in the Weekends Arts College all those years ago um, and seeking ways to find that. 
Um, and also I draw on other inspirations. A number of years later, I came to the work of uh, Michael Chekhov. That was actually, it was about the same time, but it was a slightly slower journey. And now, you know, I blend between, you know, aspects of Michael Chekhov's work, the work of Suzanne Bing and the French lineage there, but also lots of other kinds of influences and other kinds of performance practices, both from Europe, but from around the world as well. And I suppose in a way we're all blends, aren't we? Whether, whether we like to see it or not, and maybe there's something liberating also like Paola was saying, there's something liberating about acknowledging that it's us in dialogue. We talked a bit about that, I think, in our pre-meet, in dialogue with these techniques. And then, as Paula said, it's us fundamentally in dialogue with the performers that we're training, the performers that we're directing, or, you know, or the directors that we're mentoring. It's, it's a process of that kind of dialoguing. And I do think that this French tradition has, Paula put it very beautifully, but at the heart of it, there is something about empowerment and centering the participant or the actor. Um, and you said something else really nice there, Paolo, as well, but about kind of um, essentially it is that holistic relational exchange with people. And I think you're right, to some extent, that is the antithesis, isn't it, of having like the master. Because I feel in this lineage of practice, or for me, now I'm much older and I've been doing this for, you know, a long, long time, the more I understand that I learn from my students as Paul was saying the better pun. So, in some senses, that's that's for sure, isn't it? Whole, giving away some sense of ultimate power and control to become actually more effective and better as a pedagogue and as a, as a director, uh, as a teacher. So it's it, you know, it's, as Paula said, there's a there's almost a contradiction. Um, at the same time, uh, like Paolo's saying, I have to acknowledge the amazing teachers that I've had over my lifetime, you know, and I always do want to name them and place them. But I think I've shifted a lot in the last 20 years now about how I position those things and even how I position those techniques, you know, both Bing and Chekhov's work is grounded in, you know, embodied play and psychophysical imaginative play, but that doesn't belong to a Western canon. I mean, you know, play, play is inseparable from aspects of performance from all around the world. You know, they don't own it. <laughs> they didn't invent it. They, but you know, they realized that they could harness it and do something exciting with it. So I suppose I'm interested now in seeing what my passions are, but also being able to sort of diversify, I think, um, and slightly kind of challenge uh, some of these structures. Although I don't know quite how we approach it. As we said, you know, masterless sounds quite curious and sounds sort of almost like positive and radical but negative all at the same time so I don't know how the heck we reconfigure those words or, or the way that we define that but I definitely know that we need something new and you know the rise of uh, the Me Too movement the BLM protests the you know the huge uh, health racial uh, equalities that we see from the pandemic that we're living in right now you know it, it's it's a lot of it's got to change so I suppose, you know, right, right now I'm, I'm like, yeah, so how do we do that? How do we make those change? How do we hold on to things that we love, but feel brave enough to critique them and challenge them and ourselves? And, you know, and how do we reconfigure it so that, so that we don't end up just not of these lineages? And those people in the 20th century in this actor train, performer training lineages who are bumped out is anybody of color. <laughs> you know, and historically in the past women, but I think still now women. You know, look, look at how poorly paid female pedagogues are in the conservatoires in, say, for example, in England uh, and movement directors, and they're mostly, you know, mostly women. And then look at how many women are bumped out of the positions of directing when they have children. So we're still in a system that unquestionably is doing exactly the same. And then you look at it in terms of race and the picture is, you know, 150 times worse. So I know it's 2021 and Suzanne Bing was struggling with all these things many years ago and being kind of overlooked, but maybe some of those things are relevant now. Thank you, Cass. So it's interesting. I'm, uh, I'm, we're, we're now going to open it up to, uh, to you all, um, but I, I'm picking up on a couple of things, which is this um, giving credit. Uh, giving uh, giving credit to you know I, I hear you uh, both uh, really acknowledging who you studied with and who your influences are so there's a giving credit um, there's a giving power 
to collaborate. There's a giving, uh, there's a giving of autonomy to students, giving of subjectivity to students. So this is a sort of giving motion which um, I don't want to identify with a female body or someone who identifies with a female body, but it, we might call it feminine, we might call it something else, but there's a kind of giving over, which I notice you both doing, and also giving over to your families and giving over to important people in your lives. So there's a, a kind of a, a, perhaps a sort of reciprocity or something going on. Um, uh, we have so many wonderful, amazing, experienced people in the room. So it's gonna be very exciting to hear you all speaking. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, one person in particular, Frank, would you, Frank Chamberlain, would you be willing to put into the chat um, De Cruz quote about Suzanne Bing? Would you be willing to do that? Great, thank you so much. I, I just wanna hold one thought before we open up the conversation. And that is for those who have studied the pedagogy of Jacques Lecoq, if you would just imagine the neutral mask waking up for the first time, imagine that exercise being taught by a woman in the early 20th century to a group of innovative students. That is the origin of that exercise. Just want us to hold that thought. It's a bit of a transformation for me. Um, she goes home, she talks to her lover, Jacques Copeau. She's, he says, you know, sweetie, what did you do with the students today? She says, oh, I put on the noble mask and I had them wake up as if for the first time, okay? One of the students in the room is his uh, lawful daughter, Marie-Hélène Dasté, and she picks up this exercise, okay? And Jacques Lecoq learns it from her and her husband. Okay, so I just want us to just, that's a little click. It just has to be a little click that this wonderful person that many of us credit our, inf our pedagogic influence uh, to was a brilliant synthesizer, a powerful, <laughs> creative and wonderful person and did not invent the exercises. We just have to really sit with this. It is true. We really have to shake ourselves out of this kind of uh, slightly hypnotic uh, effect that the naming of a lineage has had on us. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that I'm saying to my, uh, my friends in the Lecoq universe, there is so much vibrant commentary and questioning going on in the chat. I can't do it justice. Is anybody willing to unmute themselves, speak out? Falguni is scanning the room for your raised emoji hand or your raised physical hand. Is anybody willing to just go for it and speak out what they're reflecting upon? Amy, in the meantime, I can say something quickly because have been a Lecoq and you have been too. Um, but, I mean, um, it, as you said, it was a great synthesizer and very, very often the teachers that were there created new material and, and, and yeah. or, or keep searching. We know this, we know this. Yeah, they were constantly inventing. Especially one of them was Norman, uh, which, you know, he... It really, exactly. it was it was a it was a big part of uh, developing the movement, and uh, I'm, I'm talking about Norman Taylor. If someone knows him, he's in the uh, room. He's in the room. Oh, oh my God! Hopefully, hopefully Norman will speak too at some point. Um, I have some hands raised. Yes. John, you were first. John, you want to speak? Uh, unmute, unmute yourself. Yes, thanks, Amy. Um, thanks so much, both. Uh, um, both the speakers today are really so so fascinating. I just wanted to uh, respond to um, what Paula you were saying about you didn't you realized you didn't want to reproduce what the Lecoq model, the Masters model, and all that. Um, and and you mentioned a couple of things that you did. Oh, I don't want to do that. Can can you be specific about some of the things you actually re ended up rejecting and and why? Is that possible? And, and well, uh, observing like Lecoq working. Uh, you mean? Oh. In in your own teaching, is there is there something you you've come to mm -hmm. say? Actually, that part of that method or that teaching, yeah, which yeah, I, yeah. We don't do I that mean, because. Sorry, um, I think uh, a lot was referring to. Sorry, I'm I am struck that Norman is in the room now. <laughs> he was my teacher, and so I feel. <laughs> I see. Um, anyway. It, um, I think it, it has a, 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 a way of relating to people that wasn't uh, sometime inducive of developing, but it was inducive of pushing down. 
And uh, Ime was a, his own choice. I'm not saying, you know, that he may have chose to try to do that <clears throat> to see if you come out, you know, if you survive. So I, I shoot and then who survive is the, is the good ones. So it may be, it may be a, a precise system, but I knew I didn't want to do that. I knew I wanted to uh, accompany people. I'm not nice when I teach. I'm, I'm well known for that. I mean, but they, the people can laugh about it and they can tell me about it because I, uh, if I am not, uh, if, if I'm strict uh, behind that, uh, behind my pushing, there is a, a sort of love for you to move from point A or point B. That's my, um, that, that's the motivation behind uh, my action. And I didn't always felt that. I felt that sometimes it was more on egoic um, uh, motivation behind certain things. And, and yes, we, he, he really didn't like women. Uh, I can't say that. I was privileged again because I was from Padova, which is the city where everything started for him. Uh, and so when I got to the school, you know, he, he was so happy that I was there. And I think he maybe kept me on the second year for that too. I told Cass and Amy the other day that um, I was, I was uh, sure I was leaving the first year because um, I, I wasn't good as a student. I was, I mean, I was coming from my gym throw at the theater. So, you know, I was surviving literally there like this. And when I went up to interview with him where he told me I was going to stay, he said, I don't know what there is about you, but I want to keep you. Um, and, and, and maybe part of that was that it was, I was from Padova. Uh, but with women, it wasn't always nice. And one thing that I noticed in the third year that I didn't notice on the first year, on the two years before, was that he really had people that he liked and and those people could do freaking anything and uh the other people had to work a little bit more that's something else that i was like huh this is really not good for for the group for the community for the school and again it may be my interpretation but that's why i, I observed um uh kyla would you like to unmute yourself and speak Great to see you. Hi. Oh, uh, thank you. And thank you for this great conversation. I just wanted to um, highlight that it feels like a very, a continuation of our discussion a couple of weeks ago on decoloniality. And I guess my point is that, so we've just started a school in Johannesburg called the Johannesburg School of Mask and Movement Theatre. Um, and the director, Roberto Pombo, also trained with Giovanni Fusetti. Mm. And all of us are in some ways um, responding. I like this idea of responding to Lecoq. Uh, and I think that's what came out of our conversation and what's further being entrenched here is this idea that we don't need to be, we can take this as a structure and as a starting point um, and we can respond to our circumstances and to who the particular group of people are that are starting the school. Uh, and certainly as the only um, person who identifies as a woman in our collective of four um, teachers, this is a very important conversation for me um, because I, I do, and I even said in our conversation a couple of weeks ago that I, I, I do find it very male heavy, male energy heavy as well, the, the pedagogy and the, the lineage. So I love this conversation around rhizomes and a more organic structure that has shoots and roots and um, places to grow and place, places to go and that is responsive rather than, um, uh, yeah, that is responsive. Uh, and in our case, we've been very focused on race uh, and decoloniality. But for me, I think I just wanted to say that that these, these two are highly interlinked. 
for me. Um, the, the questions of uh, queerness, the questions of decoloniality, the questions of race, gender, they need to go together in our context. It's not that we, we, we can't only focus on the one if we're not focusing on what we're talking about here, which are, is just incredibly rich. Uh, so thank you. And educational. Thank you. It's really, really refreshing as a woman starting a school to hear these things. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks, Kyla. Um, I think uh, Melissa was next. I'm not sure it was it Melissa or Andrea, but I think Melissa, are you there? Uh, maybe she's lost her connection. Let's Andrea, try the, the, I'm in India, so the- Oh, you're, okay. Is, yeah. Am I on? Yep. Um, wow, really uh, wonderful and amazing to hear about the influences of Lecoq and it's so great. I wanna, I wanna research all of these different um, people and how they influenced him because of course he's not the, the only <laughs> he was a vessel and I think it's important that we're also thinking of ourselves as this sort of I kind of think of myself as a vessel of all these different different influences um, but I, I want to ask specifically about the way the room traditionally was set up in the Lecoq training and the way the autocore and the kind of via negativa approach to the pedagogy um, worked on me as a student because over the course of the two years I found myself uh, endowing the teachers with more and more authority and in the in the in our year group also this that sort of happened you know every Monday coming to show the work and listening what do they think and will they notice what I tried to do <laughs> and it, what I what I, what I feel I've done with Lecoq practice in African context and Asian context, where obviously my whiteness and my race and um, the sociopolitics around all of that with the people I work with plays a huge role. I have found I've had to completely do away with the person on a chair in the center uh, in a sort of very authoritative position in the room and, um, with the authority also of there's a sort of power in withholding you know the answers which i i also understand as a pedagogical approach like i i you know i but i position myself in that way as sort of maybe more all-seeing and all-knowing than i really am uh so yeah i have a question about that if we're talking about demastering unlearning uh unteaching and kind of renewing the methodology of this way of operating in a, in a room which is more about sharing and more about being together with uh, fellow students as opposed to sort of the classical authoritative teacher position and learner. So Lecoq obviously, the Lecoq pedagogy does lend itself to that. It's an ensemble practice. It's, it's lending itself to this sharing and, and, and kind of democratization of those power dynamics. But uh, this, but this way of him, his teaching was very set and I think very patriarchal and also, anyway, yeah, what do you think about that? Because I've had to do away with it and um, sort of have the power be in the room and we all feed back to uh, the presentation of creations, for example. Um, Melissa, this is such a wonderful question. Yeah, can I just refract your question uh, into the yeah. room? Uh, because because it's such a it's such a great question. I mean, I don't it doesn't need an answer, does it? Because it's sort of the the question is so powerful. So it's um so it's, it's something about uh, as pedagogues because I you know I'm I'm imagining that there's a huge amount of of, of experience with pedagogy in the, in the Zoom room. Um, the value of not giving a re reply. Okay, so this via negativa, which Norman, uh, who's in the room, and I have talked about this, he never, no, Lecoq never stated it as such. He never said via mm -hmm. negativa. That, that's something that's been uh, imputed to his pedagogy. Um, so the value, is there value in withholding this? Yes, a withholding of answer what is that? Is it a power play? Is there anything valuable to it? I really, you know, this isn't sort of just a big occasion to sort of bash the patriarchy. It's like, what is that thing? What, what's, what's it good for? Does it do anything? What do you do with it? What do you all do with it? That withholding of answer or of reply or of critique, is it, does it have any value? 
um, I'm very, very curious. I mean, obviously, Cass and Paolo, it'd be great to hear you, but also just in general, um, what do we think? I mean, what is that? I, I just like, sorry, I just like to mm. briefly uh, <clears throat> clarify that because this via negativa, it, it, it's really a pollution uh, of, the, of the withholding uh, the, the answer. Uh, on, on the website of my, uh, of my school, I stated, we do not give answers. <clears throat> and that's so important. It's not a power game. It's not, is that you, when you find the solution, you have eat it and digested. Uh, experiencing things is not having information. So the creating the space for the student to uh, experience and find uh, what works and what doesn't work, uh, giving feedback. When, you, when, when we give feedback on what doesn't work, it is not to be negative, it's for the student to understand, oh, okay, we went a little bit too far right, we went a little bit too far left, and it's a, it's a, a conversation to guide the student to, to find their own answers. I think this is priceless. I will never give answer and I really will suggest that you stay away from people that gives you answers and information because that's exactly what creates the, the, the mold. Because I may have an answer and I know how it goes and you may find a different answers and it still work. And, and in that moment, we both have learned. I, I will always remember Lecoq doing a, um, a neutral mask exercise uh, the, when he said the neutral mask don't touch, the neutral mask don't go closer, blah, 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 blah. There was a huge things about neutral mask not getting in physical contact. And two people embraced and he turned around and he said, it worked. And so th this, this, is, this is why it's important not to, um, not to lead by saying, but by letting people doing and discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that in the state, this is a little bit, um, uh, is taken as being mean. I've been told that, that I'm too hard, I'm too mean, and I, uh, all that. But it's, I, I will never, if there's something I will hold on until I die, is this, because when you find out something that way, it's yours. No mine, it's yours. And you can take it and run with it. Great. So, so um, I'm going to keep on with the people who've raised hands, and uh, please, if you are inspired by that particular question that Melissa's asked, so please speak to that. Um, uh, Andrea, I think you're you're next. Would you like to un unmute yourself? Hey, <laughs> hey everyone. Hey. Um, I feel really overwhelmed right now <laughs> um, to answer or to speak, just because there's so many people here. Um, okay, so this this is what I kind of got inspired to talk about, even though there's like quite a few conversations going on. Um, so uh, I'm I'm autistic, and um, sorry. <laughs> so I experienced the world in uh, quite an intense way. Um, so thank you for opening up the conversation to me. Um, I think I feel quite emotional um, for many reasons. Um, specifically, that what you said, Amy, about um, about the neutral mask and uh, experiencing what it would have been like for a woman to first propose that, you know, for that to come out and to say that. And I don't know why, but when you said that, I just yeah, just became very emotional. So I thought I would share that. Um, also, I find this this space, uh, even even me being here now and just crying, like I feel quite 
constricted by how we have conversations online and, and these boxes and everything. Um, quite challenging. <laughs> Anyway, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience um, as a neurodiverse person in training, um, just because I feel that might be something that many people might not know of. Um, well, my experience was that um, I was initially interested in joining and going to Le Coq in Paris, um, but um, so here we've spoken about via negativa as kind of withholding, um, withholding of, you know, the teaching or withholding of the answers or withholding, whereas like in, in some other instances, I've heard of via negativa as being um, a, the kind of way that, you know, saying no to something before it's kind of started or like if someone's doing something being like no that's not the way so I just wanted to clarify what it was because you know I've been to I've I've, I've met with other students at the school who um, the way that they've found you know whatever it is that they're trying to figure out is by a teacher just saying no 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 um, and and so that's one thing. And I think it's another thing to, you know, have students like share something and then for the, the teacher to kind of be like, you know, like, like holding, holding an answer, even though there might not be an answer, but holding a space um, for the answers to come to the students. So I feel like those are two, two different things. And I have encountered both of them um, in, in people who have trained in, you know, who teach clown um, and also who teach Lecoq practices. And if we're talking about the one where students come in and the teacher just goes, no, or like, you know, just pushes you to the side as a way of kind of saying, you know, you've started all wrong, you need to try again, or, you know, what you're doing is terrible, you're shit, you suck. Um, I feel like that's something different. And, um, I can say that any instances where I've found myself in that kind of environment, there is no way that I would have been able to continue because it would have been completely crushing. I do not understand, you know, what that means or, you know, it would, it, it doesn't work for me at all. So, one thing that I found positive about my experience when I was at LISPA was that even though I have um, dyspraxia as well, which means that my body is like a little bit behind from everyone else. So obviously the first year when we're doing, you know, all of the um, movement practices where the mime is very important and the physicality <clears throat> is very important, I very much struggled. But what I was able to find was that in that environment, in that year, that instance that I was there with the teachers that were there at that time, um, there was a kind of opening to figure out how the way that my body worked could then bring something new and be developed and be created into something new. And for me, that was probably the most important thing that I could take. And I hope to be able to hone that in to help support other people who are neurodivergent in these spaces. Um, and yeah, and I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Andrea, for taking such a big risk in, from your little Zoom box. That was greatly appreciated, <laughs> greatly appreciated and very, uh, very important what you said. Um, and uh, I think that's a great disambiguation between uh, two types of via negativa. We have to be clear which is which. One is holding a space for the student's creativity. And the other one is, is something that, you know, we, I think a lot of us are familiar with is non c'est pas ça, you know, the, the, the immediate sending off of, of something which um, there's a very powerful statement actually uh, that I remember from Lecoq that was, I'll say it in French, on ne quitte pas les premières traces, which is you don't depart from the first movement of an improv. 
Um, and that is my memory of the Sepasa moving people off was that something very specific, uh, specific quality was being looked for in the in the improv. And the first trace of, of the attempt by the student was not what was being looked for. So it was a very, very specific attempt to find what was being looked for. I think that's a very different thing. That's almost, I would say, diametrically different from what you're describing, Paula. Um, just, to, just to say thank you for that disambiguation. I think that's important. Um, great. Uh, Vicky, I think you had raised your hand next. Would you like to unmute? Yeah. Um, so as we talk about being a woman, whatever, whatever that is, um, the thing that comes up is just the question about our archetypes and the archetypes through our lives. So um, what is it to teach and be in your 20s? What is it to teach and be in your 40s, your 50s, 60s? And the, the different stages and the different roles that we bring um, and that, you know, kind of within our society, really there's, you know, kind of talk of menopause, talk of female elder is kind of absent. You know, when you get old, you're kind of, there's very much this kind of within our, the way in which we relate to elderly is we kind of disregard and we send, you know, kind of, oh. but actually there's the, the vital wisdom is, is, is present, especially, you know, kind of what is the feminine uh, wisdom that we can bring. Um, and, and, you know, what, what does that, how does that come through? Or what I'd be really interested to hear um, from Paula and Cass, like your experiences of, of diff being in different archetypes, maybe also the, the, the different archetypes relating into being a mother or, you know, or how that, does that connect into your teaching? Or actually, is it is it completely separate? When you come in to teach, do you put on a, your teaching mask and mm -hmm. come into a different neutral space? Um, so it's really reflecting on that. And then also um, how within teaching movement um, can we, is there work, is, is there richness in integrating other practices that are female, that they, they, they have come up through, through generations of, of female movement practices, such as the female circle dancing. There is this incredible community. And it's, when, I, when I had an experience doing it, there was incredible uh, trauma released in, in that process. And there was this vast holding field and it felt like suddenly tapping into um, a strength beyond, you know, kind of within pregnancy and beyond like the, the depth of the body that that's not really touched on kind of suddenly it was harnessed there. And it was like, whoa, there is this utter power that we can withhold, you know, we can get through so much we can endure. And I just wonder like how, um, how we can, is there a place to integrate that? Or maybe it's already present in some aspects, but where does that sit within our movement practice? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Cass, Paola, would you like to? Cass, Cass? I always speak too much, I talk too much. <laughs> Cass, would you like to say something? Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, Vicky. I think when I was younger, um, sort of, beginning as a pedagogue, beginning as a director, uh, you know, moving from sort of being a performer. I think I, for different reasons, I didn't bring myself into the room as much. And I think I was still a little bit in love with the idea almost of kind of master lineages and seeking this true pure essence. And as I've got older, I've done it more and more and more. And sometimes I wasn't sure. And, you know, I've sort of, I've gone with the flow and I've, I've gone in terms of what students that I've taught over many years have said, but going on what they've told me, often they've said it's very important. So I'd always bring into the space at some point or another that I'm a queer mother. Um, you know, when my daughter was little, it was very helpful because I would often do exercises and games with her, which she would excel at, of course, and I would struggle with because, you know, I'm a middle-aged adult. So I would bring it in terms of anecdotes or in terms of my life or in terms of my identity. And I found that the more I did that, the more I was able to encourage students to bring their own identities in the room. What's your, what's your kind of cultural practice of storytelling? What are the cultural archetypes from your, from your community, from your background? Do you know what I mean? What's your feeling of being a woman, a man, non-binary non or trans? You know, what's your identity? What's your story? So I've, I've definitely had a shift. 
And as, I, as I've felt more able to do it myself, I found that I'm then making a space that has enabled students to bring themselves into the studio, which isn't to say we don't want them, I think, to, to be able to transform and find an energetic presence to be able to become a completely different character or a snake or a tree. But I don't want them, I don't want to push those aspects of myself outside of the room and therefore create an environment where they think that they have to as well. So, I mean, that's my own personal journey, but I think it's an interesting thing to sort of grapple with. Obviously you've got boundaries, obviously you don't want to overshare, but I've been quite struck by how much even just small sharings can do in those kinds of contexts. I talk a lot about as well, uh, talking about physical work, I talk a lot about, you know, my own body, my own injuries, my own pregnancy, my own child, due to me, my own disabilities. But also I will talk about, if you like, um, the fact that when we're talking about things like habits, for example, um, you know, can we ever escape all of them? We can at least try, you know, Lecoq is saying, isn't he, that neutrality is a temptation. It's maybe not something you can ever really achieve, but can we find these ways of transforming? But I'll also talk about, you know, um, my own kind of physical habits, in terms of my own uh, mixed ethnic background, my, you know, my age, my, my sexuality. Um, and I think that there is something quite helpful about that. Um, so yeah, my journey, I suppose, in, in, in brief is that there's definitely been a shift there. And I think the other thing that she, she, you talked about was something about the depth of the body. And I thought that was a lovely expression, the depth of the body. Um, I, I don't know how much uh, in teaching practices we've, we've looked at the depth of the bodies, you know, sort of plural, really. I think that there's still a very, you know, rigid divide between who we are in the politics of the world sometimes and how we deliver, uh, you know, training. Um, and I think we've sort of, we're, we're grappling with that, aren't we? But uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I think there's still a politics about what's allowed to be kind of in the space uh, and out of the space. And because of that, I'm thinking about the very important points uh, that, that were just made earlier on about being neurodivergent. But if we can't also bring ourselves into the studio in terms of our identity uh, and issues like being neurodivergent, then in a way, we, you know, we can't really develop practices that are going to better respond and better empower and better enable people. If people can't bring in their cultural stories, their, you know, their own ethnicity, their own identity, issues of disability, um, you know. And the depth of the body, I don't know, I'm gonna think more about that. So that's a good question, isn't it? And, you know, and, and when we do and when we don't explore that. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wonderful reflections. Thank you, Vicky and Cass. Yeah, great. Um, Mag, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm just really thrilled by the conversations that are going on. So thank you, Paola. Thank you, Cass. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone who's involved in the discussion. I just wanted to sort of speak from a perspective of an um, Eastern European practitioner trained in, um, in Poland in, in very much the Grotowski's and Michael Chekhov's traditions, Stanislavski's traditions. So slightly different. I'm not that familiar with uh, I know Lecoq's work, but I'm not experienced in, in his practice, but uh, there was this conversation, ongoing conversation here about via negativa, and I, I keep thinking about how it is, how via negativa is prevalent in Eastern European uh, practice, uh, theatre practice, still on culture, and I, I can only reflect on that uh, from the position that I am at now, because I was part of that uh, let's say movement when I was back in Poland now I'm based in London seventh year now and so because I'm facing perhaps going back to Poland I keep trying to ask myself like how do you tackle and I speak about via negativa here that comes from the tr grotesque traditions um, and, and believing in the perfect actor who strips of the layers um, of, of his body to, to sort of in a, in a sense and the skills and, and to become that pure actor and it does bring it does bring that sort of quality of or pro propagates in my opinion toxicity and I I've, I've experienced this so Andrea thank you so much for sharing I'm totally with you when I was a student I've been going through that a lot staying on the stage not knowing what I'm doing and all I, I was hearing was your shit <laughs> you, you, you should better off think about doing it differently come back but then you come back your shit again and, and so there is a lot of that going on I don't think it needs to be done that way there's you know very valuable comments here but I keep thinking and maybe maybe more uh, experienced practitioners and people who like Paola you're coming back to Italy now uh, or elsewhere 
Uh, how do we tackle this mindset? This mindset is still very much prevalent. I speak to my colleagues, Polish colleagues, and I find it so hard to have a conversation when theatre is seen as a collaborative, truly collaborative practice, where that sort of that ownership, you know, of a method is not as important as it is, you know, how we use that, how do we facilitate it, how do we empower people and train people. So this is just my thought and question. Uh, thank you. This is this is wonderful. Thank you, Mag. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to say something first. Um, and I, I see there's one more person who's got their hand up, Rinske, and I'd love I'd love to you to speak too. Um, we have a, we're we're trying something new, which is that um, we're aware that we don't get to complete a conversation uh, in the time we've allotted on unrehearsed teachers. So we're going to ask you if if there's something in this conversation which has sparked your interest and you'd like to see a part two, could you put the um, the theme of that part two in the chat? And we'll record that so that we um, we could possibly carry this forward because you know it really is a tremendously rich conversation. Um, uh, so I don't want to. Uh, so Mag has asked a really important question. Mag, is it okay if you stay? Uh, can you stay into the uh, period after the the um, chat because uh, Paula and Cass are going to stick around and we can talk a bit more about the Via Negativa? Is Absolutely. Mag there? Is that okay? Because yeah. I yeah. just want Rinske to be able to speak before we close tonight. Sure. Um, so please stick around. Great. Okay, Rinske, would you like to speak? Uh, sorry, you're. You're. Uh, I think you're still on mute. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is my first time in this forum. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the um, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I'm here in Melbourne, in Nam. And uh, I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that this land was never ceded. So uh, I'm in the antipodes, as you will all recognize. And so this conversation, I joined partly because the concept was um, masterless women teaching physical theatre and the whole, not the whole, but there's been an incredible um, thematic concentration on the legacy of Lecoq. And I just want to say that our traditions here, I've been teaching movement uh, uh, for nearly 40 years, I guess, in, in theatre schools. Um, and I'd like to say hi to my colleague, Jenny Lovell. Um, and really, here it's all heritage. It's all legacy here in Australia. Uh, the only teachers I've had in the Lecoq tradition are Philippe and Monica. And for me, Monica's whole thing really directly to me, and it, it's been a, uh, a principle of my teaching, is that we are all magpies whiskey. <laughs> and so, you know, you take this and that, whatever works for you. And so, so, and that has been my my methodology, really, because it, there is no there's no masters here in Australia. Uh, everything is a conflagration of uh, a whole series of legacies, and in some ways, the strongest part of my practice. Uh, you, yes, Lecoq to some extent, but it's not my real my love. It's Laban. But it's, it's really through Liz Pisk and, you know, Mary Vigman and through Monica that has started the process of assembling, assembling. Uh, uh, I love that work, rhizome or rhizomatic. For me, it's like mycelium. I think what we've all done is kind of like we, no one owns the work anymore whether it's a woman's legacy or, you know, um, uh, influence or a it's like it's the underground that pins all of us as physical pra or, or practitioners who believe that the instrument of the body is the means by which we communicate, whether that is um, in, a, in a particularly codified form uh, like a mask or, you know, a particular genre, well, melodrama or tragedy, or whether that is embracing text, naturalistic, post-dramatic, whatever. 
this is the means by which we communicate. And, and I just wanted to say that uh, we are the crucible, crucible uh, through which all this work um, kind of create, you know, ha has its al alchemical process. And that I acknowledge uh, a, a whole series of great and wonderful academics and um, practitioners in this forum. And, uh, you know, I think like my colleagues that it's no longer looking back, but looking forward. The cultural safety issues, the issues of gender and um, a agency across, um, uh, yeah, well, you get what I'm saying. So I th thank you very much for letting me speak, Amy. You, thank you, you know, All of you are um, my, what would you call it? I've, I've watched your work for a long time, but thank you. Thank you, and thank you for these that wonderful closing reflection, which um, uh, the the depth of the body, I think, is another way of putting what you've said, the um, the crucible of of our experience, of our embodied experience. Thank you so much, um, all of you, and it's been a really great pleasure and a great honor to host this conversation tonight. Um, we will continue next week. Um, may I ask, uh, Jehan, can you unmute yourself to announce our lineup? Ah, I'm unwell versed in the lineup. I think next week is Mwenya, right? Mwenya, do you wanna you wanna speak to the lineup to next week? Sure, I love this passing on. Um, thank you everyone for for this incredible discussion. First of all, uh, next week we are taking um, a slightly different direction in the unrehearsed futures format, and those of you who have been before will know that there's usually a guest or two and. Um, it goes like this, but we are guestless next week and the invitation is really to come back and to have a conversation as a community um, about the three uh, broad themes, I guess, that we have for season two, which are plurality, possibility and planetarity. And the question on the table is um, about thinking together about this idea of planetarity in the context of the pandemic and whether we have missed a moment, right? That there's a, uh, in the discussion we've had so far about this question, we've been thinking about the fact that at some point early on last year, there was a real moment where so much felt like it had broken down and broken apart. And there was a kind of spaciousness in how we think about what we do as educators and theater folk of different kinds. And a question now, I suppose, um, around, yeah, wondering if, if there was a moment then that might have passed or not, or if in fact we are well in that moment and all of the kinds of uh, ways there are to come to this question and uh, yeah, do a bit of reflecting, I suppose. So please come back. Uh, the invitation as always is open to everybody. Everyone. Invite your uh, colleagues, but yeah, it's a slightly different format next week and I very much look forward to seeing you back if you can make it. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Yes, please do come back. We really enjoyed having you and we will stick around now. It's not a, it's a, it, we're, we're closing the recording and we're closing uh, this particular discussion, but we all stick around. Uh, if you want to stick around afterwards, we'll all 